My belt, nah, I need to change it. No one buckles up dead centre no more. It's got to be on the side. One smooth little twist and, yeah, the buckle's sitting perfect on my hip. Just so. This is good. This is the good luck belt. The grandma belt, passed down from great grand through to me. I hope it circled a whole load of luck over them years because today I'm gonna need it. My t-shirt's now loom too. It was grandma's band shirt, those Korean dudes she used to follow. She bought merch every time she went to their gigs and was so happy to hand over a spare. She's 82 now and reckons she can't carry it off like she used to. It's weird though. This shirt is from the wear once and wash days. I mean, man, can you imagine it? Just one little wear and you dash off your shirt into a washing machine. And some folk even run half loads. Why would you do that? This shirt is serving two purposes. First, I can throw in an opinion about my grandmother's music taste if me and him run out of things to say to each other. Second, I'm hoping that there's a buildup of deodorant particles from all the wares that went before me. I've sniffed the armpits to check and all's good. There's no residue stink. The sun out there is ripe and I really can't have no wolf sneaking ahead of me today. Because today, today at last, we're doing it. Me and Cruz are hanging out. No, more than that, he's taking me out somewhere. He won't tell me where, he wants it to be a surprise. Man, I won't let on I know exactly where we're going. It's rude to break a boy's heart so soon. You know what else is happening today. You can't have missed it. They've been throwing the adverts at us for months. You must have seen the plane they had flying over with the banner last week. Today is the first day zero. All our taps are turned off from 10 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. Of course there's exemptions, pregnant women, old people, little kids and so on. But my mother is so fierce about this, she'd glue our taps shut herself, even if we did have a bedroom full of screaming newborn babies and a 90-year-old uncle gasping in the corner. So nothing's flowing. We've got enough water put aside for drinking and cooking, but no one's having a long, lazy shower this afternoon. Who cares if they have their first proper date with crews? But it doesn't matter. My mirror is telling me that I look it. Even my hair spruced, though, it took a while to believe mum going on about waiting for the natural reasons to kick in. They did kick in. Then they did not stop kicking in. I'm wearing it up because it's just a bit too slick. Last week, me and Nina made dry shampoo. Corn flour, plus some of that pretend cocoa powder stuff, plus lavender oil. Just a micro dot of the oil because you don't want to grease up your scalp too much or what else is the point? Nina was the guinea pig. We stirred it all up in an old bowl, then I had to brush it on her roots. Karen in the tutorial made it look dead easy. When I finished with Nina, she just looked dead. 
There was cocoa flour everywhere, more across her face than on her head. She was pale and grey. Zombie Nina wasn't the vibe she was aiming for. And then she started complaining that her head was itching. When she tried to run her hands through her hair, her fingers nearly got glued to her scalp. Flour plus natural greases. Mm -mm. So we washed it all out. A proper wash. Not the filter rain stuff in the barrels, not even the grade two drinking stuff, you know, the water where they bleached out the sewage and tell us it's okay for a brew. We used old school proper water to wash Nina's hair. And we didn't even sneak it out neither. Mum's got our family down to 75 litres of water a day, long before the London Council put the camp on overusing. We had the rocks in our cisterns, the grey water butts, the water meter, the three minute shower alarm, everything. So me seeing all that top grade water sploshing about like it was worth nothing, man. It was hard to stop myself licking it off of Nina's head. I rubbed in the shampoo, the proper shop shampoo, quick before I embarrassed myself. Nina's dad got a whole tank full of the good stuff. He buys it up cheap from the poor folk who need the cash and rumours are he sells it on to the farmers at blown up prices. I don't ask too many questions though. Nina did take me into the cellar once. Forget the water. They've got rice. Three big barrels of it. Who the hell can afford that? Hardly no one's growing it no more. Most of them countries got flooded out or knocked down with the droughts. Mum remembers it happening. She said it was weird. Everybody was grumbling about the price of rice, but nobody was paying attention to the reason why their basmati was becoming a luxury. It was like they could ignore it because it was far away in Asia. We should know by now. We're all connected. If I think about it, if I think about Nina's dad and his stockpile, Nina couldn't be my friend no more. As it is, she's stopped coming around my house because she says mum's side eye feels like it's burning off half her face. I told mum she should go and side eye Nina's dad as he's the bad one. Then I think about Nina washing her hair, like she just don't care. I tuck in a curl, that curl, that looks like it's trying to run away and live on someone else's head. Maybe my hair does look better down. It would need a bit of a clean. I could grab a scoop from the water butt on the garage roof, add a splash of vinegar, maybe some orange oil, sploosh it over my head. Nah, no time. And hair down needs different earrings and different earrings need different lipstick and different lipstick needs... I'm going to keep the hair up. So that's it. Hair, belt, t-shirt and the shorts I've been keeping clean for two weeks now. Got some vintage Converse scrubbed up and waiting. I am ready to go. And now that I'm ready to go, I can't shift. Me to brain. Move. Brain to me. You've been picking up this boy for three weeks now. You expect me to work properly when all your thoughts have been squished into one big cruise shape? It's what we've been waiting for. Brain. This is it. It's what we've been waiting for. So, move. I make myself pick up my bag. I make myself turn around. I make myself march out the door. I make myself and bag. I'm done. Just one second I'm flying, then I'm spat like a dead pigeon on a windscreen. You all right, honey? Am I all right? I'm lying flat on my stomach in the grass. My knees hit the ground so hard they probably heard the echo in Croydon. My mother is lying next to me. Of course she is. She's like an alligator studying her prey, and her prey is grass. That is what she does all day. She lies around with her notepad and her measuring stuff and looks at grass. All that grass lore, it's a bit like the belt passed on through our family. I come from a family of grass measurers. It's not their official name. Actually, my mum turned her red hot side eye on me when I was stupid enough to say grass measurer in her presence. That was the best way to explain it to Cruz. But it's just grass in it he said that's what everyone says but mum's always saying that you've got to get down and dirty on the ground and look it's like when you go to a football match and you see all the fans there in the same kit 
yelling and chanting. It's one mass of the same people. But of course, close up, everyone's different. Grass is all, grass is all different. If you ask mum, she'll give you a guided tour of what grass likes dry, what likes super wet, and what grass doesn't care at all. She says most folk only get interested when the big weather stuff happens. You know, the massive waves sweeping away the sea walls and the rivers bursting their banks, so someone's grandma's got to be piggybacked to safety. But mum says, grass seems little, but it's got a big voice. Listen to it and it can tell you your future. It's because our family listened that we've still got green around our house when most people are staring at concrete. But still, when mum's doing her grass thing, she needs to buy some cones and glue them to her back. She's a danger. She says, sorry. She helps me to my feet. She tries to brush me down, but I stalk back inside. I can feel my hairs come loose and my knees look dented. I can't go on my date with crews looking like this. There's gonna be a crowd. There's gonna be security. There's gonna be cameras. If my face pitches up on the tea time news, I want that face to look like business. Likewise, my knees. Okay, I'm gonna say this once. Quietly though, I don't want her to hear. Part of me thinks mum tripped me up on purpose. Me and my mum are close. I tell her everything, even if I don't mean to. Maybe I sounded too enthusiastic when I told her about Cruz. It's not like me and him are gonna close down our love net profiles or nothing. Everyone knows that you're supposed to be together for at least a month and really trust each other before you go that far. But mum says that I'm only 17, I've got the world ahead of me, and I need to leave room to meet future people. But I've barely met Cruz yet. Do you know what else I think? I think Auntie Corey's been at mum again. Aunt Corey is that auntie. She's one who calls people like Cruz filth. Failed in Lakeland, Try and Hackney. Cruz was born here in London, for God's sake, but Aunt Corey goes on about the London she knew, how she stayed and braved the pollution when everyone else was moving to their dream homes in the country. Now all those dream homes have been washed down the rivers, she says, the filth have come flooding back. Aunt Corey was one of the mob holding up banners when the council made plans to build over Victoria Park. Lucky if she doesn't look much like me, so none of my friends made the family connection especially when she kept popping up on TV being asked her opinion. What did she say? She puts on her posh voice. It isn't personal, of course, but it's not like London safe, is it? The Thames barrier has been closing and opening so often, it's like an airport door. When we do flood, and of course we will, it's going to put pressure on our already stretched resources. We don't need another two million people moving into London. Then she does that awkward little laugh. She told mum she was ready to throw herself under a JCB to stop the Victoria Park development happening. She didn't, sadly. And people are not filth. They're Londoners. And Cruz is one of them. But today is day zero and it's day zero because, yeah, we are running low on water. When the council first announced day zero, mum's phone was so full of Aunt Corey messages I thought it was going to burst. Mum's pretty patient with her. She says it's not Corey's fault that she inherited more than her fair share of the bitterness genes. But I can tell you that was one day no one could trip over Mum. She'd be lying there in the grass, her phone would ping with another Aunt Corey message, and a second later she'd be swearing so hard and so loud no one could miss her. When the milkman walked past up our path that morning, his hair was straight. When he walked back past Mum, he had a head full of curls and a seriously astonished face. Mum's cuss words go back to the 20th century and span several countries. They don't come out often, but when they do, they impress. I still bet Aunt Corey's gonna get invited over for Christmas though. But back to today, and me and Cruz, and what we're gonna see. Imagine having that for Christmas. Even Aunt Cory would get a kiss from me, and if she magicked up that as a gift, no chance. I've heard it's been locked in a vault and kept at a special temperature. There's going to be an armed guard, just in case. Maybe they'll carry it in on a cushion with the trumpeter marching in front. Who knows? Me and Cruz are only going to see it on the big screen anyway. I didn't enter the lottery to be an arbiter of taste, where you get to be on stage and witness the whole thing. 
Nina's dad bought her 50 lottery tickets. She still didn't win. Yeah, I smiled when she told me, don't judge me. I better hurry up. Man, my knees, they need some serious body cream. If you put my knees next to a camel's in an anonymous identity parade, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I wish, I wish, it, it sounds mean, but part of me wishes we were doing something else today. If I had a choice, I'd take crews down to the reservoir. It's not as low as last year because we had serious rain in February, so, so serious that Victoria Park stayed flooded. Mum said it was because the council cut down most of the trees that used to catch them in the rain. Now when the clouds explode, every single drop hits the ground. But she made sure to say it when Aunt Corey wasn't around. The reservoir is my peace palace. When I was little, me and Mum used to go all the time. We'd take a blanket and a box of homemade chocolate brownies and iced tea. Though, now I'm starting to wonder where she got the water she used for the tea. She'd show me white throats and sedge warblers and red kites. We once saw a pair of fire crests with bright yellow Mohicans. Another time a weird voice said hello to us, then let out a cut word that even Mum didn't know. Later we found out it was a minor bird that had escaped from a pet shop in Wakeford. Mum says everything's a bit wonky now. Sometimes the birds come before the insects wake up. She gathers up volunteers to help her make lists of what birds are coming early and to make sure that there's enough food. She thinks that the birds are migrating earlier every year. The best time me and my mum went to the reservoir though was on my seventh birthday. We were walking towards our favourite spot, just off the main path, between the high grass and the almond trees. Suddenly mum laughed. I know you, she said. Of course she did, I'm her daughter, right? But she wasn't talking to me. She was talking to the grass again. She crouched down and called me over. Look, honey, it was a tiny patch of wild strawberries. She sneaked one for each of us. And man, it was, it was like the sweetest dream just burst in my mouth. I couldn't believe it was a strawberry. It was nothing like those things that Aunt Cory brings us at Christmas. Giant, red, damn expensive things that make my mouth taste like I just sucked air out of mum's bicycle tires. A month after my birthday, there was a fire because some idiot smuggled in barbecues and didn't put them out properly. All the places where me and mum used to hang out were scorched grass and ash. I wanted to think our strawberries were still there, shining like treasure. But there was no chance. I've been back loads of times. Most of the stuff has grown back. Grass is tough, man. I haven't seen strawberries again. Maybe Cruz can help me look. So, it really is time to go. I don't want to be late. Not for Cruz. Not for this. Gran said this is what she used to do when she was my age, but usually not until the second or third date, when it was a bit late and you knew each other well. She said it was a teenage ritual, but doing it like this is so different. I've seen pictures. I know what they look like, but I won't be able to hold one. I won't be able to smell one. I won't be able to taste one. Grandma says the weather's shifted. It's either too hot or too wet. For me, it's all I've known, but I do know that the ground became too hard or too full of water, so the farmers didn't grow them no more. Mum said they used to be dirt cheap. Now the dirt won't behave itself, and they became a luxury, like rice. Did you see that fashion shoot with Chicago West? It was about five years ago. She had a massive bowl of them on her table. I wonder if she ate them. Maybe she gave them away. And now it's time. Armed guards and a cushion and a trumpeter and me and Cruz maybe hand in hand standing in the middle of that crowd wondering and watching as it arrives. Are we supposed to cheer or cry or sing the national anthem? Man, we're gonna see the last ever potato brought up on stage. Lord Mayor of London's gonna make the first cut, I know that. Then I think some fancy chef's gonna take it from there. They say she's cutting it freehand, no fancy equipment. There's gonna be a team to monitor the temperature of the oil because imagine after all that, it just gets burnt. What's it gonna be like if you're one of the arbiters of taste, sitting there and waiting for the moment? Do you get your piece on a gold fork? 
I mean, man, it's an occasion. Gran said it was so much easier in her day. You fell out a gig or a bar and into a chicken shop because you could buy them there, not just dodgy nuggets. That can never happen now, it's too late. But I'll try to picture it. Me and Cruz sat on a bench watching the river. He turns to me slowly, his hand out like this, and he offers me his bag of chips.